and he was still saying something and I picked up the man and the blood was dripping he got along my feet so I found one and something just from deep deep like it took a drink of water from the water and you drink you drink what? his blood the details of this crime are darker than your worst nightmares. They will turn in my head, tell me that you didn't fall on the ground at the same time. Go ahead, keep doing it, keep doing it. Every time you keep killing again, keep taking this off, keep doing it, kill it too. What followed was a murder so brutal, so utterly monstrous, that even the U.S. Supreme Court turned a deaf ear to Pablo's pleas, not just once, but twice. This morning, the U.S. Supreme Court was asked to block the scheduled execution of Pablo Vasquez. He's the man who killed 12-year-old David Cardenas. David Cardenas was just a 12-year-old child on the night of April 18, 1998, when Pablo Lucio Vasquez snatched his life away. I don't know if they were both in and blacked out. I started hearing voices in my head. And I told my cousin that somebody told me to kill him. Kill him. But this wasn't just a confession. It was the haunting revelation of a man who almost became a vampire. In this spine-chilling interrogation, watch as detectives uncovered the disturbing crime details of the murder of David Cardenas while unmasking a monster in disguise. But to grasp the full horror, it's important to first look back at April 18, 1998 and unravel the events leading up to this crime. On the evening of April 18th, David was last seen at a neighborhood party. When he didn't come home, his family's worry quickly turned to dread. Then, on April 19th, 1998, an anonymous tip shook Hidalgo County. This anonymous tip mentioned that a 12-year-old boy named David Cardenas had been murdered at that very party. What exactly happened on April 18th was shrouded in mystery. The investigation began with more questions than answers, but detectives were able to identify 15-year-old Andres Chapa as a suspect. Police also found out something interesting. Andres, also known as Andy, was actually David's friend and the one who invited him to the party. Through his testimony, detectives were able to find David's body four days after the incident on April 22, 1998. What the detectives found while discovering David's body left them in sheer shock. The autopsy report exposed the chilling details of the murder. A deep wound at the top of the head, a slashed throat, one arm completely severed, another partially detached, skin torn from the boy's back, several brutal facial wounds, likely from a heavy tool. Each finding painted a picture more disturbing than the last. Detectives now faced the pressing question, what could drive someone to commit such a savage attack on a 12-year-old? Eager for answers, detectives pressed Andy, who quickly confessed and named his accomplice, 20-year-old Pablo Lucio Vasquez. The hunt led them over 325 miles away to Conroe, a Houston suburb where they finally made the arrest. Once arrested, Pablo wastes no time confessing. But this isn't just an ordinary admission. It is far more disturbing than anything the detectives had expected. Okay, Pablo, can you tell us uh, what occurred? I want you to start since Friday. Oh, Friday, the 17th. Um, April 18th, 1998. Me, Andy, Patrina, and uh, David, we went to a party. Um, we were looking for him. And we got invited to that party. So, we, we first we had our dog, we walked in the dog, and then we got there. So, they asked us if we could come back. So, we did. We took the dog home and went back. And when we were there, they asked us to work here. So, we started drinking here. And we stayed there for at least two or three hours until it was over. What time did you get there? They go on. Nine, eight, nine. First two was early in the daytime. It was day six. And then we got back. We took off. I came back. And me and Andy and David came back. And they said, we wanted to drink. So I got a beer. I was drinking. 
the, the beer finish, so it'll be past the bottle of liquor, and the baking liquor, and the iron, but I don't know, it's usually buzzy. What type of liquor? Um, I don't know if it was Presidente, because it was strong, they poured a lot into wine, and I was really pretty um, drunk. So somebody smoked it there, so I started smoking some too, and I did boxing and everything. You did what? Coke. I did some. And plus, yeah, I was really loaded. And they are up and decided, yeah, because the party was finishing, somebody gave the right. David was just 12 when he was invited to the party, where Pablo and Andy were openly smoking, consuming hard drugs, and drinking alcohol. It's possible that David too was pulled into the mix, as he was an easy and vulnerable target. Andy, also underage, was part of the reckless scene. But Detective Ricardo Suarez soon discovers that things took a dark turn as the three left the party that night. What, what time did you guys go home? It was about 12. It wasn't really like going to be Saturday morning that night. It was my time. I didn't know where that little guy was going to go. He took off what little guy? David. I don't know where he going to be, so he followed us. He went with us. They gave us the right to the house. And then I do it then. He went went to the back. I went inside. And I came to the back. And I told him, what's, what's up with the plan? And he said, I don't know. He really needed the back. And I don't know, did it back then, I blacked out. I started hearing voices in my head. And I told my cousin that somebody told me to kill him. So um, I snuck up on him. And, and he fell down. Where'd you hit him with? The pipe. Where'd you get the pipe at? It was on the floor, like where he was at. And he looked at me at first, but then and he looked at me too, and like, he just didn't have no feeling or nothing. Did Andy try to stop you before you hit him? No. Well, he didn't say nothing. He just looked at me like, like he thought something was wrong. And so I stopped. Where'd like, you hit him at? What was he doing when you hit him behind the head? He was looking at me. And then he said something wrong. And I and he was right there, and he was still alive. When you hit him three or four times, where did you hit him at? He was still alive. And Andy told me, you killed him, you killed him. And I go, no, he's not dead, he's still alive. So I went inside, and Andy was getting everything, and he stuff ready, so I told him we were going to bring him. And he said, yeah, and I got him. And we took him, and Andy had the show. OK, you went inside for what? Huh? What did you go inside for? I just went inside to go check inside. Like, did anybody I heard anything? Did anybody, well, was anybody awake? Yeah. And, like, nobody was awake. So I came back outside, and my cousin had a knife in his pocket. Your cousin who? I did. Okay. And I saw him, and I got the knife, and I. Pablo's disturbingly neutral expression as he recounts the brutal details of trying to kill David hints at something far darker than apathy. It actually reveals a chilling detachment from the horror of his actions. He sounds like he is narrating an everyday incident rather than a gruesome crime. He speaks as if he only observed the violence rather than committed it. This emotional disconnect suggests a distorted sense of self where Pablo either cannot or maybe refuses to acknowledge the monstrous nature of his actions. But what he will confess after this is beyond comprehension. And then um, he was still like, talking and stuff. And I picked him up. He was, I just put him on my shoulder like that and I carried him. And I threw him on the floor because he was too heavy. And I grabbed him from my hand. I picked him up, I grabbed him. And he was still saying something, and I picked it up in the air, and the blood was dripping. It got all over my face. So I, I don't know, and something just from jeep, jeep, like I took a drink of water in the morning. And you drink, you drink what? His blood. And I don't know, and my face was cranked with his blood. And I put him down because I felt weird. I don't know. And then my cousin said he's still alive, or something like that. And I'm like, Took him across 
the road, like, um, when Pablo describes drinking David's blood, there is a subtle yet unsettling excitement in his voice. This shift in demeanor, no matter how slight, speaks volumes about the nature of his psyche. It is a hallmark of psychopathy, a trait often seen in individuals who derive pleasure from revisiting their violent actions. For people like Pablo, reliving the moment of horror serves as a source of gratification. Psychopaths often lack empathy, but they compensate for that emotional void by seeking excitement through destructive means. He was saying something, and my cousin got the show, and like five, six times in the break, and my mind. All I knew was that he actually really. When you hit him on the face, what was the guy saying? What was David saying? Any words that you can remember? No. No. Just saying like, oh, like, like, I don't know if he said a joke or something, but he was saying something. But I heard his I seen his blood crushing on there and I thought I had panic. So I go just go put him back there. So we took him back there. And we started digging the hole. And the dirt was too hard so we just dug a little tiny hole. And I put him there, and by the time I went, I was just finding stuff to cover him up with, and we covered him, and I put grass and pieces of wood on him. And by the time I realized, I took off his ring, but I lost it somewhere right there, and his chain was busted. I threw that away too. And from then on, we walked to Randy's house, and we just, I took a shower, and my cousin got the clothes that was full of blood. Cause I was Your cousin who? Andy. Okay. He got the boxes that I was wearing were covered with blood. And he told his mom that he was quitting or something like that. And his mom was awake? No, she was in the morning. Mm -hmm. They asked us, well, why are you doing so late? Coming home so late? So we were drunk. And yeah, and yeah, yes, it then the next morning. And the next morning I woke up. I had, I really had my hand guns up his back when my boat broke up too. And I just wanted to get out of it. And I waited all day there, just thinking about what I had done. And so I got one. I wanted to see too because I told my cousin I'd be like, I looked down and I feel like so because I did something wrong. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, no, don't do that. And after that, that's when I want to leave. I want to leave because. They find out they're gonna kill me no matter what. That's they say this, and I couldn't go. No, because no, don't go and I say that. But I'm not thinking we could have done it. And he got both of us in trouble with it, and anything. And he he said yeah. So that day passed. The next night, that's when I saw my uncle and I had. The next night being when? Um, Saturday was already Saturday morning. The next then Saturday night, I told my uncle that I was being good. Your uncle who? My uncle, the uh, Andy's dad, sir. And I told him that because I had did something bad and he was mad. He got mad at me for doing that. What what exactly did you tell him? That I had done something bad that I had hurt some kid really bad. And who did you tell this to? My uncle. Who's your what's your uncle's name? John. John? Yeah. One. Two. One. One? Yeah. So you told him Saturday night that you had done something bad? Yeah. But then I did you show him the chain? Yeah, I showed him the chain. I said, look, this is where I took away from, but I threw it away at the same time that, that same night I threw it. I don't even know, because I was in the, in the car, I threw it, I tossed it. You were in the car going? Well, I stayed there until the next morning, right? And then I asked my uncle if I could go to back to Houston. And he said, well, I don't want no trouble, then I will not. But I was just thinking, man, I didn't try to you know, everything that I did. Though Pablo briefly mentions his desire to take his own life out of guilt, his voice and body language tell a different story. His confession is rushed as if he's more eager to escape the interrogation than deal with any real remorse. This disconnect raises questions about the authenticity of his guilt. What's even more unsettling is the reaction of his family. While David's family was devastated after finding their son in that condition, Pablo's family tried to shield him after the crime he committed. 
Despite Pablo's admission to one of his uncles, no one in his family reported the murder. This complicity is as disturbing as the crime itself. This reaction points to a deeply ingrained dysfunction within the family dynamics. In this case, the family's silence becomes a form of complicity, deepening the disturbing nature of the crime itself. As the weight of the truth begins to surface, Pablo starts showing fleeting signs of remorse. But what he reveals next is worse than the most disturbing nightmare David's parents could have ever had. And then I started from getting the little gun that and I intend to go back and hang out and I didn't ever go. The, the autopsy says that someone, we don't know who, a piece of his back on. And there was a knife. You know, I, I how, did, how, how did the... How did, it, it was a video of how we did it. But well, I don't think I did it. I didn't think when we dragged them because we dragged them on the cement, maybe in the cement, stripped his back. Um, there was a nice cut all the way across his back, like a knife, or like somebody took a knife to his back and and cut and cut it and cut it, you know, and they cut it out. We were trying to cut off his head, and they were trying to cut off the shoulder, so they didn't really do it. Who was? Me and I because we were trying just to do it. Well, what was your reason for trying to cut off his head? The only time you think we can. Who was? The devil was telling me to take a rip on him to keep it, to keep it, and it couldn't come up. And I was just freaking out because I was hearing that. And what about Andy? What was he hearing? I don't know. He was just like, I don't know. He was just, I don't know. He was just like, going with it too, I guess. Did Andy blood? No, he was just, he threw up. He did something. I told him, if you were going to do that, you know, I told him, you know, he was telling me to do it. And he uh, was like, and we just went along when we did. Have you gone back? Did you go back the next day on Saturday to go see him? No, I didn't go back. You never went back after that? No. Pablo confesses that even after repeatedly hitting David and slashing his throat, the boy was still clinging to life, and this revelation takes the horror to a new level. For any parent, the idea that their child suffered through such relentless brutality is unimaginable. Yet, Pablo explains it with the same detachment that marked his earlier confession, stating that he and Andres had to continue hitting David, this time on the face, to ensure he died faster. The coldness in his tone shows a shocking lack of empathy, almost as if David's resilience was a mere inconvenience rather than the desperate fight for survival of a terrified child. It is clear for the detectives to see that there is something extremely wrong with Pablo. As they push him more, Pablo confesses to something very intense about himself. Have you ever felt like that before? Yeah, when I was in California. How long ago was this? Before I came from California. How long ago was this? Um, day, two days before Christmas. But I was here on, I got here on, I was on the bus right here on Christmas. And I, I was here on New Year's Day. Had you been drinking when you felt that, when you heard that the first time in December? No, so I was on, a, there was some other drug that they have out there and called Where is this, like in California? Yeah. And I got addicted to that and that actually like a addicted drug. I just, I, was, I stayed up for two whole weeks without sleep. And I got, I was dressed in black and um, it was the middle of the night and I had a couple of you. And I tied a rope on it, and I put a rope on my neck, and I, my uncle was cutting me, and I thought that I couldn't get done because somebody told me to, to jump, and if I jump, the rope was going to take me. What's your uncle's name? My uncle, Guero. What's his name? I don't know his name, but... Where's this at? California. What part of California? Um, Tenere County, Visalia. Is that where he lives at, in Visalia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He, he was he was pretty out of me too, but he, he had to come up the tree and get me done. Cause the whole people Did there. he call the police? So he just told me, man, he was not to he knew that he was talking me out of it. He talked me out of it. And he talked he talked him and I started listening to him. Pablo's confession about his attempt to take his own life is a clear indicator that he was spiraling long before he committed the murder. 
This admission isn't just a passing comment. It signifies a deep internal struggle that has been left unchecked. His suicidal thoughts were a cry for help a red flag signaling severe emotional and psychological distress. Ignoring or overlooking this distress meant that the underlying issues driving Pablo's violent tendencies were never addressed, which likely played a critical role in his ultimate outburst against a vulnerable 12-year-old boy. In fact, when detectives ask why he has been so forthcoming during the interrogation, his answer hints at the same underlying turmoil. His honesty stems from a place of unresolved guilt and desperation. Why, <clears throat> why are you telling us the truth? Because you didn't want to know the truth. I don't want to have that inside of your own mouth. Because I know the truth. I don't want to be like, mm -hmm. constantly thinking about it. Because it's going to turn crazy and I end up killing Pablo Vasquez confessed to the murder following his arrest and was indicted on capital murder charges for David Cardenas' death and the theft of his jewelry. In March 1999, he was convicted and sentenced to death in Hidalgo County. After years of multiple appeals, Pablo was executed on April 6, 2016, at the age of 38. Andres, being a minor at the time, was also convicted but received a 35-year sentence. He became eligible for parole in 2015, but was denied, eventually receiving it in 2020. Even earlier in the day, he had expressed remorse uh, over the crime uh, and, and was trying to uh, figure out how exactly he would say that to the family. In Pablo's final hour, both his and David's families were present. Justice, long awaited, was finally served. Vasquez begins his statement. It says, it's time. He says, you got your justice, and apologizes to the victim's family. 610. His cousins say, I love you against the glass and make hearts with their hands. 611. The lethal dose begins. 635. The lethal injection process is over. The impact of one man's crime left a haunting mark on both families, forever altering their lives in ways they could never have imagined. Pablo Vasquez's crime was not just a horrific act of violence, but a reflection of deeper psychological issues that went unaddressed for far too long. Could early intervention have prevented David from this tragedy? How much responsibility lies with those who chose to conceal the truth rather than confront it? Share your thoughts in the comments section below, and like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more such content.